let's get started. We got a new set of chapters here, our next unit in the course. And we're going to be starting off with a functional group that we've sort of seen a whole lot, but we've never really explicitly talked about, made it the topic of our uh, conversation here. And that is going to be alcohols. All right. So we all sort of know at this point an alcohol has that OH group. Okay, what we can call a hydroxyl group. All right, the functional group itself would be what? Polar or nonpolar? Polar, but it really, the molecule as a whole, it would depend on how big those carbons and hydrogens chains are. But absolutely, our hydroxyl group is a good polar functional group because it is capable of those hydrogen bonding interactions. So small alcohols will be soluble in water, but as that carbon backbone grows and grows, they can be, uh, become insoluble. All right, so let's start off with something that we've kind of talked about a little bit, but again, we're going to make it our focus here, and that is nomenclature of alcohols. Let's just get an example molecule here. All right, so step one is, of course, to find and name your parent chain. And as we've discussed before, that parent chain has to contain that functional group, in this case, that OH group. All right. And for alcohols, you will use the OL suffix. Okay, so my four carbons here are my parent chain. And so four carbons would be butte, right? And so this would be butanol. Butanol, rather. All right, then we would find and name any substituents. All right, well, next, when we number our parent chain, as we've seen before, we're going to prioritize this functional group, making sure to give it the lowest possible number in our name here. All right, so. We're going to prioritize that functional group. So in this case, I'm going to number it starting from the right-hand side here. So my alcohol group, my hydroxyl group is on carbon 2. So this wouldn't just be butanol, but 2-butanol. All right, and then step 4, put everything together. So let's do one more, and then we'll complicate things. So I got my longest continuous set of carbons, these six here. This one carbon group is sticking off of that parent chain, so this would be a methyl group. If we go in and number our parent chain, 
one, two, three, four, five, six, going the other way. All right, so which one of these two numbering schemes am I gonna pick, red or blue? All right, so importantly, it doesn't matter what's going on with this methyl because this has priority, right? Our functional group has priority. That's the only thing I pay attention to when I pick my numbering scheme. So in this case, I'm gonna go with the red numbering scheme. So that makes this five methyl three hexanol. Cool, okay, so if we look at our name here, we'll just do this one. We have this OL at the end, that implies our alcohol functional group, all right? But there's also something key in this name, well, and then we have the butte, which is our four carbons. But the A-N in that name also implies something. And that is that we have all single bonds. Okay, so then how are we going to name a molecule that contains two functional groups now? We're gonna put in both a double bond and that alcohol group. Okay, so importantly, we can note we're going to prioritize our functional groups here. All functional groups are assigned a priority and they're ranked, all right? Alcohols, at least at this point in the course, are the highest priority functional group that we know. All right, so when I look at this molecule here, I find my parent chain. I don't have any substituents. When I number, I'm going to number in such a way where I only pay attention to the location of that alcohol group, making sure that has the lowest possible number. All right, so we always prioritize our functional group and alcohols are the highest priority. So we're only gonna pay attention to the alcohol. All right. Now we have this double bond in our uh, in our structure here. So instead of having the AN in the name, what are we going to use for an alkene? EN. Okay. Now the weird part about this is that both the EN and the OL are suffixes, so we need to number this in such a way where we build it into the back of the name here. So this would be pent for en to all. Right, I have my double bond located be between carbons four and five, so that's where the four ene comes from. I have that alcohol group on carbon two, so that's where the two all comes from. And then the pent is, of course, my parent chain length. All right, but we got two suffixes, so we gotta build the numbers into the back half of the name. All right, and to be clear, we could always do that. So this other one I could have written five methyl hexan three all, but we don't bother to for the most part. I mean, you can, it's not like it's wrong, but it just looks weird, right? We have to when we have both of these functional groups in there. Okay, so that's one example with a double bond. Let's do an example of a compound that contains a triple bond and an alcohol group.
right? So remember, you got to count carbons on both sides of the triple bond here. So one, two, three, four, five, six carbons in this compound. I'm going to number in such a way where I prioritize that alcohol group. Okay, so six carbons. So this would be hex or ene, yn, one, all. All right, I got my double bond between, I'm sorry, my triple bond between carbons four and five. So that's where the four ion comes from and my alcohol group on carbon one. All right, now another thing that's gonna rear its ugly head again in this chapter that we probably haven't thought about in a while. I want you to name this compound for me. This one was similar to the one that we did before. This would be 2-butanol, but what else do I have to include in my name? The stereochemistry. So this sort of stereochemical inversion, something that we've seen before, is going to come up over again. So let's just make sure that we can deal with these chiral compounds here. So let's just review RS stereochemistry. Okay, these are for what we call chiral compounds. All right, so for these, we're going to look about a chiral center. Does anybody remember what makes a carbon a chiral carbon? Boom, down, bound to four distinct groups. Every single one of its bonds are different, right? So by chiral center, we mean four distinct groups. So this guy right here. Okay, we're going to label those groups from highest, which would get a one to lowest, which would get a four priority. So just like we, uh, when we looked at EZ stereochemistry, we assigned priority to the groups. In that case, there were only two of them. So we got away with just saying high and low. Now we're gonna label all four of them, rank them in order here. All right, so my highest priority group is going to be that oxygen for my alcohol. I get to these carbons here. I got a tie because they're both carbons. So I do just what I did before and I'm gonna list what they're bound to. So which one's going to be next in line here? The one on the left or the one on the right? The one on the left. So that's two, that's three. And what's the fourth priority group? That implied hydrogen. Okay, so now you're going to connect one to two, two to three, three back to one, and you're gonna see if you're going in a clockwise or counterclockwise direction. All right, so if the fourth priority is pointed into the board, as is the case in this example. Then R is clockwise and S is counterclockwise. Okay, so for this example here, let me just redo it. That fourth priority group, that hydrogen was pointed into the board. And when I connected one to, do, to two to three, this went in the clockwise direction. So this would be the R to butanol. All 
right? But what if our fourth priority group is pointed into the board, or, or pointed, uh, yeah, pointed out of the board, yeah, there it is. All right, so now my alcohol group is on a dash, which implies that my hydrogen is sticking out towards me on a wedge. Right? We said, okay, you can either redraw this compound so that that low priority group is pointed into the board. That's how the rules are defined. Or you can just switch the rules up. And that's kind of the easier thing to do. Right? So instead of sort of redrawing it, what we said is just if the fourth priority is pointing out of the board, Right, meaning pointing up at you, then just switch the rules. Now R is counterclockwise and S is clockwise. All right, so for these chiral compounds, we got to assign this R and S chirality to it, this R and S stereochemistry. And we do that by labeling our groups from highest to lowest priority, connecting those first three groups. If we draw a clockwise circle, we have a different set of rules than if we draw a counterclockwise circle. All right. Um, this is something that obviously we discussed last semester. It hasn't come up yet again this semester. Um, so we're going to use this opportunity of alcohol nomenclature to kind of practice that, make sure we don't forget it. All right? Cool. So alcohol is not too bad, right? You use the OL suffix to indicate that you have an alcohol functional group. Uh, you prioritize that alcohol functional group when naming. All right? But now we're going to sort of introduce, and we're going to do this a lot. Now, every time we introduce a new functional group, we're going to talk about its priority here. All right? So this is kind of the first clash of priorities that we're going to see is when you have both an alcohol and either a double or triple bond, as was this example here, and you gotta include both of them in the name, both the location of the double bond and the location of the alcohol group. All right, we're also going to use this as an opportunity to reintroduce slash practice this RS stereochemistry that we did last semester. Okay, can't forget about that. All right, so. Talking about reactions of alcohols here. Okay, so the first one would be acid base reactions. I.e. deprotonating an alcohol. So let's take our alcohol here. The alcohol, if we're deprotonating it, that means that it's playing the role of an acid. So we have some base. It's going to come along and take that proton away. So we're left with this oxygen that has this formal charge of negative 1 and whatever our conjugate acid is. Okay. Importantly, these deprotonated alcohols, these are what are called alkoxide ions. All right, not just an oxide ion, but it's got an alkyl group on there as well, so an alkoxide ion. We've seen these before. They are both good bases, but maybe more importantly or more useful in chemistry, they're also really good nucleophiles, right? So if we can deprotonate an alcohol, we have created both a strong base and a strong nucleophile. So that's all well and good, okay? But importantly, the pKa of these alcohols are around 16. 
that's not like absurdly high, but that's pretty freaking high. That's, that's comparable to water. So the bottom line is we can't just use any old base to do it. We have to use something relatively strong. In particular, sodium hydroxide isn't gonna cut it. An alkoxide ion is just as good of a base. That reaction would favor your reactant side here. So you're gonna have to use something stronger Remember, the further we get away from those electronegative fluorines, the stronger our base is. So something like sodium amide, right, where you have a nitrogen with a negative charge, uh, would be a good base to do that with. Okay, one exception, an alcohol that's actually quite easy to deprotonate is one that we introduced last week or two weeks ago, I guess. Had a special name associated with it. What's this one? Phenol. So phenol is readily deprotonated with something as simple as sodium hydroxide. Okay, and why might that be? Let's take a second to draw the products of this reaction here. All right, so this ion that's produced here, this is actually still a good nucleophile. It's got that net negative charge, but this is now a weak base. If we look at the difference between these two, all right, our alkoxide ion we said was a strong base. This thing right here we said was a weak base. What's the big difference? Stability for sure, uh, right? The more stable the conjugate base, the weaker the acid is. All right, or the more stable the conjugate base, the stronger the acid is, I'm sorry. So that would make sense as to why this was a stronger acid. Phenol is a stronger acid. But what is it that makes that conjugate base so much more stable? Resonance, right? It can pass that negative charge all the way around that ring, right? So it can have, it has these resonance structures available to it, which would just help to pass that negative charge all throughout that ring structure, right? And so anytime you can draw multiple resonance structures, they would help stabilize that charge. So absolutely. This phenolate ion here is resonance stabilized. So quite a bit stronger of an acid, quite a bit easier to remove that proton than compared with a regular alcohol. Move this back up, okay. Cool, all right. Um, other reactions, so we're gonna sort of review a lot of reactions that we already covered but last semester. So I know that everybody studied the crap out of these all winter long, but just in case, let's make our, a cheat sheet here. So, we're gonna talk about the various ways that we can prepare alcohols. All right, and the first was using this very reactive functional group, which we actually started the semester, or started the course talking about reactions with, and those are alkenes. There are a few different methods that we have for preparing alcohols from alkenes. All right, we got five of them. I'm gonna use this particular example to illustrate three.
All right, the first and the cheapest is to just use dilute sulfuric acid. All right, so H2SO4 mixed with water. <coughs> We could get a little fancier by using this um, HGOAC, this mercury acetate in water, followed by NADH4. And then the last one using BH3, NTHF, fluorine. And tetrahydrofuron followed by hydrogen peroxide and water. Okay, so these are these four different reagents that we can use. Um, they're sort of different in some subtle ways, all right? So first of all, let's color these carbons about our double bond here. All right, because the biggest way in which these differs is the regioselectivity of these reactions. Certain reactions favor the more substituted carbon, other reactions favor the less substituted carbon. All right, which one of these favors the less substituted carbon, the blue one? The BH3, right? So the borane, and you will see this kind of a few times when this BH3 cro crops up. Its claim to fame is specifically selecting the less substituted carbon. So now I'm going to do this addition reaction. Where on one side of my double bond, I get a hydrogen, and on the other side, I get the hydroxyl group. All right, this is what we call the anti Russian dude, Markovnikov means we select the less substituted carbon. All right, the other two methods that we have are Markovnikov additions. So the OH group is going to go on the more substituted carbon. We're gonna do the mercury acetate one first. All right, so now I'm again gonna have a hydrogen and an OH group added to either side of my double bond, but now that OH group is going to go on the more substituted carbon. So this is the Markovnikov addition. All right, and then for the last one, we're gonna actually look at the mechanism here to see if we can understand what our major product should be here. All right, so we're going to use this hydronium ion here in our mechanism. Of course, a bunch of that floating around in our strongly acidic solution. Uh, what's gonna be the nucleophile in this reaction? The alkene or the uh, hydronium? Which one has all the electrons? The alkene, the pi bond, that's where the electrons come from, right? This thing right here is pretty electron deficient with its positive charge. It's not a good nucleophile. So it's going to be the double bond that attacks that proton there. Okay, And so we get this intermediate that we see quite a lot in organic chemistry. 
the carbocation intermediate. And that's what explains the uh, Markovnikov addition here is that that carbocation wants to form on the more stable, inter, uh, more substituted carbon. Is more stable on the more substituted carbon. Okay, but because of this mechanism here, there's always something we have to watch out for when we have these intermediates. And what is that? Hydride and methyl shift, right? So that's the big difference between these two here. These are both going to be Markovnikov, but for this particular example, which I picked on purpose, we're gonna make note that for this one, we have to watch out for hydride and methyl shifts. Okay, so with that in mind, everybody take a second and draw me what my product would be. So in this case, I'm going to have this hydride shift that occurs. So my carbocation and thus the water, or and thus my alcohol group is going to form on that more substituted carbon. Okay. So now I think practically speaking, students are like, well, why the heck would I ever bother with this H2SO4 business if I'm gonna have to worry about these hydride and methyl shifts? Why don't I always just use the mercury acetate? Well, yeah, on pencil and paper, that's great. There's no difference between the two. When you're running a lab, there's a humongous difference between the costs of these two reagents, right? So practically speaking, so, uh, sulfuric acid's like the dollar store reagent, right? It's like everywhere, we got a ton of that. Why wouldn't we use that, okay? It's only when we really have to be careful that we would bother busting out our expensive reagent, our mercury acetate, all right? So we have these different methods from starting with an alkene and preparing an alcohol, all right? We also have these other two methods. So I guess if I'm being good, we can finish our, our uh, mechanism here for a hydride shift. To be clear, that pair of electrons that's in that carbon-hydrogen bond jumps over to that carbocation, taking that hydrogen with it. So now my carbocation is on that more substituted carbon. And what is it that's going to be reacting with that carbocation in this mixture? The water, okay? Now, importantly, it's not going to be a hydroxide ion. That would make our life easier in terms of steps in our mechanism. But this thing is not going to survive in the presence of sulfuric acid. So we're going to have to react it with water first. Oops. And then we'll have to have an additional step in our mechanism to deprotonate that water, to remove that extra hydrogen off. Okay. And for this, we will just use to reform our acid catalyst here another water molecule. Okay, 
The other thing that we learned how to create, starting with an alkene, was we had two methods for preparing a diol. In this case, I'm going to use a cyclic alkene to demonstrate the differences between these two. The first one used osmium 8 oxide in pyridine. Bisulfuric acid? I don't even know what you call that. Okay, the next method. Use bromine and water. Followed by sodium hydroxide. Both of these created diols. All right, so in both cases, you're gonna add an OH to both sides of your ring. The difference is the way in which they're added For the osmium-8 oxide, this is what we would call a syn addition, meaning both groups are added to the same side, so either both wedges or both dashes, all right, but we're added to the same side. If we do the other method, that's what we call an anti-addition or they're added to opposite sides. So in both cases we get a diol, the difference is the stereochemistry. So, starting with an alkene, we got a few different methods for preparing these alcohols. Another good starting point for preparing alcohols are aldehydes or ketones and what are called reduction reactions. So, reduction of aldehydes and ketones. So if we take an aldehyde or ketone, so let's just pick something simple like acetone. We can reduce it, which remembers the op opposite of oxidizing. So creating fewer carbon oxygen bonds. All right, you'll sometimes see this like as just an R meaning reduction. We'll talk about specific reagents here in a second but this would convert this ketone into an alcohol. All right, so real quick in this reaction, what bonds are being broken? The carbon-oxygen double bond. What new bonds are being formed? Hydrogen-oxygen and? Hydrogen-oxygen single bond and what else though? Be careful. We have one other new bond up here, carbon. the carbon-hydrogen, right? So this re reagent is really putting a hydrogen on this carbon right here. And we're going to see, we're going to look at the mechanism here in a second. But that's the key here, sticking that extra hydrogen on what used to be a carbonyl carbon. All right, so we're going to look at two sets of reagents that will accomplish this. And at this point in the course, they're going to be identical. We'll learn that one's stronger than the other in a, in a future chapter. For right now, we just need to be able to recognize both of them. Okay? So this is NaBH4 is what's called sodium borohydride.
and the other one a l r l i a l h four lithium aluminum hydride okay and the key word here in both of these is hydride all right a hydride is a hydrogen that's got all of its electrons. It's got a, a pair of electrons, or what we would say is a nucleophilic hydrogen. Okay, so that's going to be the key to these two reducing agents right here. They have these nucleophilic hydrogens on them. They are hydrides. And I know, everybody's mind's all blown. You're like, what? Hydrogen's a nucleophile. Hydrogen's never a nucleophile. No, normally not, right? Normally, hydrogen is playing the role of an acid, a proton donor of sorts, like we saw up here in this mechanism. So that's what makes these reagents special here. Is now we're going to see hydrogen playing the role of a nucleophile. Okay? So, um, like always, the sodium, not doing a damn thing. It's really the borohydride here that's going to be the key player. Likewise, the lithium, those group one metals, they're never doing anything, right? So these are the key players here, are these hydrides, okay? So if we're gonna take a look at a particular one and our reaction mechanism here, I'm gonna draw out one of these borohydride bonds explicitly here. Okay, because it's this pair of electrons that is my nucleophile in this reaction. Okay, and my electrophile is something we're going to see over and over and over again in this course to the point where I'm hoping I'm going to have it just so drilled into you that you have dreams about the electrophilic carbonyl carbon electrophilic carbonyl carbon. We're going to see this carbonyl carbon playing the role of the electrophile over and over and over again, right? It's in this polar bond where all of this electron density is sitting on that oxygen atom, leaving that carbon atom in our carbonyl relatively electron deficient. The electrophilic carbonyl carbon. We do a whole freaking chapter on aldehydes and ketones where that carbon plays the same role over and over and over again. All right. And so as always, we're going to have our nucleophile attack our electrophile. One of the things that makes this carbonyl carbon so good at being attacked is I can't stop there. But what else can I do to make sure that carbon doesn't have too many bonds? Resonance. Yeah, so I, more or less resonance, but only one step here. We can kick that pair of electrons up onto that electronegative oxygen. Okay, this will create, everybody take a second actually and draw, well, I'll just show you. This creates this intermediate here. Which we see a lot in reactions of aldehydes and ketones so much so that we give it a special name. Okay, now I have my H down here. This is what we call the tetrahedral intermediate. We call it a tetrahedral intermediate because, of course, our carbonyl group starts out as being a trigonal planar, and then it gets attacked by this nucleophile and adopts this tetrahedral geometry. Okay, So from here, this thing is stuck until we do our second step in our mechanism here, which is to add some sort of dilute acid, which really just serves, serves as a source of proton for that oxygen.
I'm going to explicitly draw in my hydrogen to make a point. All right, so what we would do if we wanted to convert acetone into this 2-propanol is we would first use that reducing agent. In this case, we chose the sodium borohydride. It would be equivalent if we chose the lithium aluminum hydride. But there's always going to be this second step, as we illustrated here, where you have to follow that up with some sort of a dilute acid. Some, some source of proton so you don't get stuck at that alkoxide ion step. Um, and then lastly, just to summarize preparation of aldehydes and ketones, something that we talked about before as well was alkyl halides three different alkyl halides here. What's the big difference between these three? Yeah, substitute primary, secondary, tertiary, right? So this would, would be a primary alkyl halide, secondary, and tertiary. For primary alkyl halides, we can use a good nucleophile, good base, like the hydroxide ion. And we would get our substitution product as our major product. All right. This is not a good method for using secondary alkyl halides. If we tried to do the same thing, our major product would instead be the elimination product, which isn't the end of the world because we know how to turn alkenes into alcohols. But the bottom line is this isn't really the path that we would want to go for that to create an alcohol or at least we wouldn't be able to do it in one step. If we have a tertiary alkyl halide, we can actually pretty efficiently get our substitution product as well, but we're gonna use the weak nucleophile version. So not the strong hydroxide ion, but just the weak water. And we talked about mechanisms. These would be SN2 mechanisms. Major product here would actually be elimination. But when you use the tertiary, it's an SN1 mechanism. All right, so the last one we're going to talk about today are what are called Grignard reactions. All right. We kind of talked like we randomly introduced this and then said basically nothing about it as at the time. And we're like, we're going to kick the can down the road on this particular type of reaction. But it's a really powerful type of reaction because it will create new carbon carbon bonds. All right. So first of all, if we take an alkyl halide, we're going to default to bromide here. And we add in some magnesium shavings. That magnesium kind of magically works its way in between the carbon and the halogen. And this is what we call, it, call a Grignard reagent.
Okay. Now, carbon, as far as the non-metals go, we really don't think of carbon as being very electronegative at all, right? We're always comparing it with these other non-metals, and carbon's the loser every time we're talking about electronegativity. But now we're comparing carbon, a non-metal, to magnesium on the opposite side of the periodic table. So in this bond right here, carbon is actually quite a bit more electronegative than magnesium, and there's a lot of electron density sitting on that carbon. So our Grignard reagent, how we think about these is we have a nucleophilic carbon. A carbon that has a lot of electron density. All right, sometimes you'll even see textbooks go as far as to draw your Grignard reagents with an ionic bond, right? An actual carbanion with a magnesium with the positive charge. I hate that, I and mean, it looks stupid, but whatever. You will see that, okay? Okay, so if we take, we're gonna look at a mechanism here. We're gonna take acetone again. And we'll, we'll do a methyl Grignard here. Okay, so we said that a Grignard has this nucleophilic carbon. What do we think is going to be the electrophile in this reaction? The electrophilic carbonyl carbon, absolutely. So these are also going to involve aldehydes and ketones. And the mechanism is insanely similar to what we just saw before, but instead of being that hydrogen hydride bond that's doing attacking, it's our carbon magnesium bond. This pair of electrons here is our nucleophilic uh, electron pair. And in order to avoid carbon having too many bonds, what am I gonna do? Kick this pair up here. Okay, and you can see that we've again created a tetrahedral intermediate where we again have that alkoxide ion. Okay, the only difference before is that last time with our hydrides we had added a hydrogen. Now we actually have a methyl group that we've added, right? We've created a new carbon carbon bond. Okay. And similar to before, it's stuck here until we do a second step where we follow it up with some dilute acid, some hydronium ion, which will help protonate that alkoxide ion. Okay, so our full list of reagents here to convert acetone into, what is that, 2-methyl, two 2-propanol, two is first to use our Grignard. In this case, it was a methyl Grignard. And then second, we have that dilute acid step. Now what's gonna make these reactions kind of tricky is the fact that we're making new carbon-carbon bonds, right? So we're making something bigger and uglier than what we started with. Counting carbons is gonna be really important, all right? Importantly, you're always creating a new bond between what used to be the carbonyl carbon. So what has that alcohol group on there has to be formerly your carbonyl carbon. Okay, so let's just practice this for a little bit here, making sure we can go both directions.
So in the first two, you're going to give me the products that we would get from this Grignard re uh, reaction. In the third one, you're actually going to look at the product and work backwards to figure out what your reagent and substrate would be. So let's do this first one. Importantly, this carbon at the base of my magnesium, that's the one with all the electrons. That's my nucleophile. And it's going to be forming a new bond with that electrophilic carbonyl carbon. All right, so those are the two that I have to connect in my product. All right, so here's this blue one. If I draw this new bond here, that's my red carbon in my Grignard reagent. All right, so I still have this other methyl group sticking off. Now I have to draw the carbons from my Grignard. So that was in the middle of this pentane chain here, these five carbons. All right, and then what is the last thing I'm missing? The OH group, right? So remember, this is the preparation of alcohols is what we started talking about here. So a Grignard is a way of preparing an alcohol from an aldehyde or ketone. You just also now have this new carbon-carbon bond in there as well, right? But you'll always have that alcohol functional group at the end of the day. And obviously, this is a big, ugly product here, right? That's what makes these kind of tricky. So remember, we got these methods of making sure we did this correctly. Uh, the simplest one being counting carbons. One, two, three, four carbons. That's these four here. Plus my new one, two, three, four, five. That's these ones here, right? And my new bond is between the orange and the green, or the orange and the red carbon. 
All right, it's the same thing here. My nucleophilic carbon is the one at the base of that magnesium. My electrophilic carbon is that carbonyl carbon there. So if I draw my carbons in, here's the blue one. I'm gonna draw my new carbon-carbon bond. So that means this is the red one. All right, and then I have this whole ring structure on here as well. And lastly, that what was formerly a carbonyl oxygen is now an alcohol oxygen. I can count my carbons again. One, two, three. Whoops, wrong tool. One, two, three. And the one, two, three, four, five, six from my Grignard. All right, and I can convince myself that I got the correct number of carbons. So now for this one, we're working backwards here, all right? The one thing that we can say for sure looking at this, pro uh, th yeah, th at this product here is that this carbon right here, this has to be my carbonyl carbon. Okay? So what was that color? Those were blue before. Let's keep this same color and see. Boom, boom. All right? And I know there's a new carbon-carbon bond between that carbonyl carbon and one of its neighbors. Which one I pick doesn't actually matter. So there would have been two sets of reagents that you could have used to get this same product here. I'll do the first one with that being my new carbon-carbon bond. Okay, so that means that these, this fragment here with that carbonyl carbon, here's my, in this case it's an aldehyde. So I have a two carbon aldehyde. All right, so then these must have been from my Grignard. So that would just be a two carbon Grignard. or it would have been perfectly equivalent to have taken the same thing. Again, you have to have that carbon that has the alcohol group as your carbonyl carbon. So this is definitely my carbonyl carbon, but I could say that this was my new bond right here. So this three carbon chunk becomes my aldehyde and my one additional carbon over here would be my Grignard, so a methyl Grignard. And either of these would be perfectly fine solutions. Okay, there's not any sort of rule as to what's a preference over the other. One of the things that makes these Grignards so great is that they're very highly reactive. There's very little restriction on what you can have as your Grignard reagent in terms of like, it could be a primary, a secondary, a tertiary carbon. You could have it be an SP2 hybridized carbon, like from a benzene ring. You can do those as well. So there's very little restrictions on that, all right? There is one big caveat to that. Grignards, we said they're good nucleophiles. They're also strong bases. All right, so we're limited in the fact that we can't have any acidic hydrogens in there or the Grignard's just gonna react with that. All right, so let's just do an example here. Let's say that we took a carboxylic acid. That has a ketone group in it or a carbonyl group in it. but it also has that acidic hydrogen. So if we combined this with a methyl Grignard again, we would not see any sort of a nucleophilic attack. Instead, what we would see is we would simply deprotonate that carboxylic acid
and put that hydrogen on that carbon from my grignard. Now, it's a very roundabout way of creating a methane here, which is probably not what you were going for when you went ahead and made your grignard in the first place, right? It seems like a lot of work to just get an alkane on the end. Okay, so grignards are strong bases. So we have to avoid certain acidic hydrogens. All right, so we said carboxylic acids aren't going to work. So let's just say we're going to make a list of things to avoid here. All right, but when I say they're good acids, I mean really good acids. So you also can't have any alcohol groups, any amine groups, or any thiols. All of those are donatable hydrogens. They will simply be ripped off by your Grignard reagent. All right, so. We have then a trick that we can use specifically for alcohols if we wanted to create a Grignard reagent. So for example, let's take a compound that has both a halogen and an OH group in there. And let's say for whatever reason we really want to make a Grignard, right? We really want to add our magnesium to create that Grignard reagent. Well, we have this OH in there and that would mess everything up. So what we're going to do is employ this strategy of what we call a protecting group. All right. This is this trimethyl silicon chloride. The first thing that we do if we add in that trimethyl silicon chloride, that will react with our OH group. forming what we call a protecting group. All right, now there's no more donatable hydrogen. So when I add in my magnesium, I will successfully have created that Grignard reagent. Whoops. Okay. So now, if I took this and reacted it with, let's say, acetone, some aldehyde or ketone, everybody take a second and draw me what my product would be.
So we still have this big ugly thing in orange, our protecting group on here. But now we've reacted this with our acetone. Oops. And what's the final step in these Grignards? Yeah, we gotta have some source of proton. And what makes these protecting groups so useful is that we can take them off pretty easily, all right? And so just by adding dilute acid, not only will we protonate this oxygen, we'll also remove that protecting group. Now we got our alcohol group back on that carbon, plus our new carbon-carbon bond from our Grignard reaction. Okay, so we have this problem with Grignards in that they're strong bases, so we have to avoid using certain functional groups. Specifically though, for alcohols, we found this method around it. All right, so we can specifically say we're talking about alcohol protecting groups here. And that is using that trimethyl silicon chloride. What that will do is replace that hydrogen, forming this protecting group here which has no longer got any acidic hydrogens. So then we can take that and make our Grignard form our Grignard reaction. And then finally in that last step where we add that dilute acid, it removes that protecting group back off of it. All right, so if we really had this alcohol that we wanted to do a Grignard with, we have to do this kind of roundabout way of using it. Cool, all right, well, we'll stop there. Great.